yeah, we're converging on on this uh, uh, discussion of divergent potential, as, uh, as Marcus observed. Uh, so um, let me begin with a little bit of, of stage setting. So um, in mathematics, you're, you're often interested in a potential existence. So what can be constructed or generated? And uh, if you look at how mathematical language was used uh, prior to the 19th century and still is used by constructivists, you say things like one. Uh, that necessarily for any number m, possibly there is a successor. Or however many numbers you uh, generated, you can generate a successor. And here's another example too. So necessarily, given any line segment, uh, possibly you could cut it in two. Uh, possibly there are two bisects. And uh, potential existence is, of course, uh, very uh, closely connected to potential infinity. So if you're a defender of a potential infinity, then uh, you will uh, accept one or two while rejecting uh, the uh, uh, corresponding claim you would get by deleting the modal operators. So for instance, you would uh, reject three. Uh, so the claim that for any number, there in fact is a successor, right? So uh, an instance of potential uh, infinity would then be uh, one plus the negation of three. And potentialism, is the view then in the philosophy of mathematics that uh, potential existence and modality more generally have roles to play in mathematics, either explicitly as on the previous slide or implicitly. And uh, the most famous version of potentialism is of course uh, the Aristotelian one, that there are potential infinities, but no actual infinities. But there are also more relaxed forms of potentialism. So uh, some of us have been interested in, in set theoretic potentialism, which is uh, uh, the combination of claims that you find on the slide here. So necessarily, however many objects you, you got, possibly you can generate your set. But it's not possible uh, to bring it about that any objects whatsoever, in fact, have a set, right? So that uh, combination of claims is uh, known as set theoretic potentialism. And um, there are now good analysis of uh, potential infinity and potentialism more generally to which uh, various people, including uh, some of the people presenting here have contributed. Uh, What's, what's worth noting is that these analyses uh, tend to assume that the possibilities in question are convergent in the sense illustrated by the, uh, the diagram here. So if you're at the bottom node, so you have a certain ontology that's been uh, generated and you have two different generational uh, possibilities. So you could generate say, uh, Suppose you've got all the natural numbers, you could generate the, the set of the, uh, the even numbers or generate the set of the odd numbers. Then you could bring these possibilities together again by generating later whatever you didn't generate uh, the first time around. And as that example illustrates, uh, this convergence assumption is often <clears throat> very natural and, and uh, uh, plausible. But without convergence, these analyses that we, we have of potentialism and potential infinity, they break down. It's a point made by Ethan in, in a recent paper. So uh, the plan for the talk then is to uh, motivate the need for uh, a theory of a, a broader form of potentialism where you don't have this convergence assumption. So what we call divergent potentialism. And what we'll do is to, uh, to use free choice sequences as you have them in uh, intuitionistic mathematics to motivate the need for, uh, for modal analysis of that kind of potentialism. That's hard. So we'll explain a certain challenge that comes up here when uh, explicating that. Then we will use so-called Beth Kripke semantics uh, for intuitionistic logic to respond to, uh, to that challenge. And lastly, uh, we'll apply the uh, resulting modal analysis of divergent potentialism 
to, uh, to try to, uh, to give an account of uh, these choice sequences that is really comprehensible in classical terms. Right, so we're going to try to, to make these uh, choice sequences, which are quite unfamiliar, uh, uh, more intelligible uh, to, 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 to more classical minds. So let me hand over to, uh, to Ethan here for uh, aim number one. Right, so I'm going to start off with the, the first goal, um, which is going to be introducing the theory of, of free choice sequences, which is how we motivate the study of divergence. Uh, and free choice sequences, as Oystein mentioned, come up in the context of intuitionistic mathematics. So I'll say just something briefly about how that happens. So intuitionism is uh, this philosophy of math introduced by L.E.J. Brower, early part of the 20th century. And it was based on this idealistic metaphysics where he thought of mathematical objects as being mental creations. And so in order to secure their existence, they have to be literally constructed as mental objects. Um, and as a result, any infinities in your theory are gonna be merely potential infinities on the assumption that no mathematical agent could undertake an actual infinity of tasks. So you could uh, have a potential infinity of tasks that you could perform to create or construct a potential infinity of mathematical objects, but not any actual infinities. And this poses an obvious problem for how you want to give an account of the real numbers, given that uh, under the classical approach, real numbers are going to be defined as actually infinite objects. You might have uh, actually infinite Cauchy sequences, or you might have Dedekind cuts, which are going to be infinite sets. And so there's this question, how is the intuitionist going to develop analysis given these limitations? Uh, if you could go to the next slide, Oystein. So Brouwer's solution is to uh, appeal to this concept of a free choice sequence, which is a potentially infinite, or as Brouwer put it, a, an infinitely preceding sequence whose values are each chosen individually by a mathematician or maybe an idealized concept of a mathematician or something like that. And then these uh, potentially infinite sequences are going to be basically Brouwer's stand-in for the role that Cauchy sequences play in the classical treatment. But it's fair to say that choice sequences have been quite poorly received outside the intuitionist school. So um, if you could go to the next slide, here's uh, a couple representative quotations. So for instance, uh, Bishop writes that Brouwer seems to have had a nagging suspicion that unless he personally intervened to prevent it, the continuum would turn out to be discrete. He therefore introduced the method of free choice sequences, which makes mathematics so bizarre it becomes unpalatable to mathematicians and foredooms the whole of Brouwer's program. Bufferman also writes a little less pessimistically, but capturing the general spirit of things. Brouwer introduced a novel conception, that of free choice sequences. With this step, Brouwer struck off into increasingly alien territory, and he found few to follow him, even among those sympathetic to the constructive position. And so behind these quotes, there's three more substantive points you can find in the objections that people make to, to choice sequences. So the first is that they introduce a temporal aspect to mathematics because they're supposed to be these objects that are, have their uh, values chosen successively in time. And you might want your mathematical truths to be time independent. And this would be a problem for that. A second objection is that choice sequences introduce a subjective aspect to mathematics because their, um, their values are literally chosen by this creative subject. Uh, and so um, that has struck a lot of people also as being peculiar. And then finally, they simply lead to results that contradict classical mathematics. So whereas even a classical mathematician could look at Hadean arithmetic and just regard it as the constructive sub-theory of the more inclusive PA that they accept. In this case, you actually have a, a choice where the intuitionistic theory is inconsistent with uh, the classical theory. So if you take all these together, uh, it's you might come away with the, the feeling that choice sequences are just kind of the, uh, the awkward stepchild of Browerian intuitionism or something like that. But against that, 
Uh, what we want to do, uh, what I tried to do in my dissertation and what, what Stuart and Neustein have been working on also in, in uh, separate work is to provide a classically comprehensible account of choice sequences. And the thing that um, both of our separate work has in common is that we try to do this by taking seriously the idea that choice sequences are potentially infinite. And then we can explicate or model that, uh, that potentialism using modal logic in the way that uh, Oystein sketched potentialist accounts have been able to do so very fruitfully. And so to start with, what's the modal logic that we want to use? Well, um, we can gloss the, the box as meaning at all future times or every moment in the future. So S4 is going to be a good modal logic. Uh, just by fiat, we can take the later than relation to be reflexive. And of course, it should be transitive too. So that'll give us S4. Eventually, we'll add another operator to that. But for now, just have S4 in mind. And then um, we can offer just a couple postulates to start to capture this concept of a choice sequence as a, a mathematical object that, that grows in time. So if we let uh, Roman variables range over natural numbers and Greek variables range over choice sequences, then first of all, we can say that choice sequences have no gaps. So as you choose arguments, you, you've already chosen all earlier arguments. Sorry as you choose values, you've already chosen values on all our earlier arguments. Um, and then we also want to assume that every argument can be assigned a value. You're, you're never going to get stuck and not be able to go any further, as it were. And then once values are chosen, they're never changed. So you, uh, you pick alpha n equals m, then it stays m for the rest of time. And then a choice sequence is always incomplete. So this captures the idea that not only are choice sequences potentially infinite, but they're merely potentially infinite. So there's always something you haven't done yet. So those are just four things we can say to characterize choice sequences in general, but there's going to be some more specific classes of choice sequences we're interested in. So as we have this motivating heuristic of the idealized mathematician, uh, choosing values for a choice sequence, it's possible that they don't impose, impose any constraints on their choice of values. So as they go along, they're completely free to choose any value on the next argument. And in this case, the choice sequence is going to be called lawless. It doesn't obey any law. Uh, so that's one extreme, absolutely lawless sequences. On the other extreme, you'd have law-like sequences. So this would be a sequence where uh, the values are completely completely predetermined. So for instance, if you imagine the idealized mathematician choosing values in accordance with some recursive operation, then that would completely predetermine what they're going to choose for the next, the, the next value. And then in between those two extremes, you might have some choice sequences that satisfy some constraints without being completely predetermined. So for instance, you might say that every value is either going to be a zero or a one, but there's a free choice as to which of those it is. So you don't have any guarantee that it's always going to, for instance, follow some recursive function. So we're going to focus mostly on the intuitionistic theory of lawless sequences here. There's a, a couple reasons for that. One is that there's a very well understood intuitionistic theory. So it gives us a nice target to try to capture. Uh, a second reason is just that lawless sequences form an essential building block for a richer universe of choice sequences. So you have to start here no matter what. And then you can build richer universes on top of that, even though that's not something we're going to try to do in, in this talk today. So uh, now, if you recall, when Oystein introduced the idea of potentialism, and these nice modal analyses that, are, that have been developed for it, uh, they all uh, they require this assumption of convergence. So if you have two possible extensions, there's always a way of bringing them together. But that's going to fail when we have lawless sequences. And here's a good way to see why. So lawless sequences will satisfy this condition that uh, necessarily for any n, if alpha has not yet in fact been assigned a value on the argument n, 
then for every m, it's possible that alpha of n could equal m. So if you haven't picked a value on n yet, then it could be anything. And this is going to give us divergent possibilities, obviously, since, for example, if you're there at the bottom node and alpha n is undefined, then you could go to that node on the right-hand side, choose alpha n equals 1. Or you could go to the node on the left-hand side, alpha n equals 0. But then obviously there's no way of bringing those two together because once you've chosen the value on n, it's fixed. And these, these two uh, values are, are in, incompatible with each other. So this gives us the case of divergent possibilities as opposed to the convergent possibilities, which have mostly been what's treated in the potentialist literature so far. Right, so we have the, uh, the desire then for a kind of a divergent potentialism and a modal analysis of that. And let me now explain why that is challenging to, uh, to develop that, uh, that kind of account. Uh, so uh, uh, ordinary mathematics, uh, be that classical or intuitionistic, uh, tends to be done in a non-modal language. Uh, including then uh, the uh, intuitionistic theory of choice sequences. So call that non-modal language L. And the kind of analysis that we have provided uh, has been given instead in, in a corresponding modal language. Uh, call that L super diamond, uh, which is the result then of adding appropriate modal operators to, uh, to L. So uh, for the analysis here to, uh, to work and relate to, uh, to the ordinary mathematics that we're trying to analyze, you've got to connect the two languages in, in some way. So um, the uh, most natural way to, uh, to connect them would be uh, simply to translate from the uh, non-modal language into the, uh, the modal language and have that be, be an account of, of how the modal analysis that we have provided uh, latches on to uh, the ordinary mathematics that is being, being analyzed. So we're looking for a translation uh, star here from the non-modal language into the, uh, the modal language. Here are some desiderata on that uh, translation. Um, something we'd like to have, uh, one isn't absolutely committed to it perhaps, but it certainly would be nice. So firstly, it would be good if the uh, star translation here uh, uh, respects uh, logical relationships uh, between uh, sentences or formulas. So uh, somewhat more technically, uh, it would be good if the translation interprets, perhaps even faithfully interprets, the logic of the uh, non-modal language. Uh, so we're uh, expressing, expressing that by means of the formula here, uh, where turn style is uh, deducibility in the non-modal language, Tur turn style superstar is deducibility in the modal language, perhaps supplemented with some non-logical assumptions. That's one to set bottom. Another one is that the axioms of the uh, mathematical theory that we're trying to analyze, they certainly ought to translate as theorems over in the uh, modal uh, theory. So uh, of course, if both desiderata are satisfied, you get an interpretation of the uh, mathematical theory in question T in the corresponding modal uh, theory. Now, let's mention now one example of, of how this can work. Uh, so this is an example developed elsewhere. Uh, it's, it's an approach that doesn't work here, but it provides a good indication of, uh, of what it is we're, we're looking for and uh, trying to emulate. So uh, in convergent cases, you could translate the uh, uh, universal quantifier as necessarily for all, and you could translate the uh, uh, existential quantifier as possibly there is. And in that way, get the effect really of uh, generalizing not just over objects available at some stage of this process of generation, but also across all the different stages. So we're calling this the potentialist translation. And uh, the claim is that that works really well, provided that the modal logic is uh, strong enough. And uh, here's what we mean by, by strong enough. 
So suppose that the accessibility relation has the convergence property that we have talked about, that uh, different choices can always be brought together again. Uh, no uh, permanent branching as a result of a, a choice that you make. Well, in that case, it makes sense to add to uh, the modal logic S4 that uh, Ethan talked about, uh, the further axiom G that characterizes this convergence property or is uh, uh, appropriate when you have convergence. The resulting modal logic being known as S4.2. Uh, if you add some other assumptions about uh, atomic predicates being stable in the sense that they never change their mind as uh, uh, the generation unfolds, then you get this nice theorem. Uh, and it's a faithful interpretability uh, result of the sort that we wanted. Right, so uh, ordinary classical logic then over on the non-modal side, uh, is right in what it says about inferential relationships. Uh, also, when you apply the modal translation here, or the potentialist translation, and assess uh, the acceptability of, of, of that uh, inference over on the modal side. And it can be mentioned that uh, something similar holds also when the logic is intuitionistic. So that's a uh, uh, standard of successor where you have just a bottom number one very nicely satisfied. Uh, now, as we've all already mentioned, the potentialist translation uh, is not available when the accessibility relation isn't convergent and we don't have action G. Those of you who like to play around with these things, uh, here's a, a little example of of an inference that breaks down in cases of uh, divergent branching. I'm not gonna go through that now. And then as Ethan remarked on for lawless choice sequences, uh, you have that kind of, of divergence, right? So the whole uh, existing apparatus of uh, uh, potentialist analysis uh, is not available in, uh, in the case of choice sequences. Now, what to do instead? So you may think that, look, um, we've got at least the modal logic S4, even if we haven't got the G axiom and uh, uh, convergence. So what kind of translation is available then from the uh, uh, non-modal language into the modal language? Well, the Gödel translation of intuitionistic logic into S4, that is available uh, given just, just S4. So why don't we try that? So here's a reminder of how the uh, Gödel translation goes. Uh, we put on, on the slide here the non-trivial clauses of the uh, translation. So atomic uh, formulas translated as their, their own necessitations. Uh, negation as necessary, not a uh, negation, uh, likewise for the conditional and the, uh, the universal quantifier. And then you have this super nice result in this case too of faithful interpretability. Uh, so uh, uh, when you have a certain inferential uh, uh, entailment over on the uh, non-modal side, then that is mirrored in uh, an S4 entailment obtaining between the Gödel translates of the formulas in question. Right? So that's very satisfying again as a, a way of capturing here modally uh, something that is expressed in the non-modal language. Uh, there is a but coming. Um, but before that, uh, so let me also mention a, a, a neat correspondence here uh, between the Gödel translation and ordinary Kripke semantics for intuitionistic logic. So you could regard the Gödel translation um, as a kind of uh, syntactic analog of Kripke semantics for intuitionistic logic. Uh, and by that, uh, we mean that um, when in Kripke semantics for intuitionistic logic, a world forces a certain formula, uh, which is what we've written on the left-hand side here with the uh, double turnstile, then and only then does that world satisfy the Gödel translate of that formula. 
So uh, look at the case of negation to get a sense of uh, how and why this works. So uh, uh, a world W uh, forces the negation of phi, just in case every extended world uh, fails to force phi. And when you look then at what it is for uh, uh, the uh, uh, ordinary modal uh, side to, to hold, then we get to the, uh, the last bullet point here. So a world satisfies uh, the negation of, uh, uh, of phi uh, translated. Uh, you unpack that. Uh, so that's uh, that the world satisfies necessarily. Uh, it is not the case that and the translation of phi. And then you get the very same uh, analysis as you had uh, in the top bullet point. So you get this neat correspondence. So far, so good. Here's the, uh, the downside of the, uh, the Gödel translation, and it is a very serious downside. So this translation really is hopeless as an exploitation of potentialism. So it's very nice for all kinds of purposes, but not to explicate potentialism. And to see that, uh, you need only consider uh, the following very obvious truth about choice sequences. So uh, for every argument x, there is a value y of the given choice sequence alpha. Okay, and that's something you, you want to say in the non-modal theory of, of choice sequences. Now you apply the Gödel translation and get that necessarily for every uh, argument. There in fact is a value y of that choice sequence for that uh, argument. But that is saying too much. Right? What you want to say is that possibly there is a value, not that you already have a value. So that's the, uh, the uh, uh, challenge here that uh, you'd like to connect the uh, non-modal language with the modal language, like you have a translation that does that, uh, providing an interpretation, preferably faithful, all that. Uh, but then uh, the potentialist translation doesn't work, nor does the, uh, the Gödel translation. So we simply need a better way to, to translate, a better way to bridge the non-modal language with the modal one. So I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Ethan to, uh, to tell you about our proposal for how to do that. So um, we're going to work up to getting a, a nice Marian theorem again, drawing on uh, what's sometimes called the Beth Kripke semantics for intuitionistic logic. But before we can get there, we're going to need to increase our expressive capacities a little bit. So uh, recall that the box is glossed at, at all future times, or you could think of it every moment in the future, including now. So S4 is going to be a good mode of logic. And we're going to keep the frame properties of S4. So we have an accessibility relation that's transitive and reflexive. And without loss of gener generality, we can take it to be anti-symmetric as well. So uh, those frame conditions are still nice, but uh, the box and the diamond aren't going to be expressive enough because they don't allow us to say in every possible future, eventually phi is the case. So we're gonna add this. Uh, so uh, for instance, to see why we might wanna say that, no, sorry, I seen those, right? Uh, <laughs> no, that's my glitch. Um, right, so to see why we wanna say that, consider, uh, the claim that every choice sequence eventually gets assigned a value on each argument. So we don't want to say for all n there is an m that is the value of alpha on n, because that says we already have an, a value for each argument. Um, but we also don't want to say for all n it's possible that there is an m such that alpha n equals m, because uh, that says like you could get a, a value on each argument. It doesn't say you will. That would be consistent with saying that you could, but you just kind of never get around to it. And for a similar reason, we don't want to say for all n, it's necessarily possible that there is an m such that alpha n equals m. Because that kind of says it never gets ruled out that you uh, choose a value for alpha of n. 
it never becomes impossible. But again, that's not the same as saying that eventually it does in fact happen. So here's uh, another thing we might want to say. Uh, as a maximality principle, you might want to say that every possible beginning for a choice sequence is eventually realized. So you never leave anything out, if you will. Uh, and so just a bit of notation, alpha in n means that if n is the code of a finite sequence of natural numbers, then alpha has that finite sequence as an initial segment. So we want to say that uh, for, all, uh, for all sequence numbers n, eventually there will be an alpha that has that initial segment. Well, we don't want to say that for all n there already is an alpha with that initial segment. So that would say we, that's ignoring the potentialist character of the universe of choice sequences. But again, we also don't want to say for all n it's possible that there's an alpha in n. Because that would leave out that maybe one never actually comes about. Maybe it never comes to fruition. It's never realized. And then similarly, again, we don't want to say for all n it's necessarily possible that there is an alpha in n. Because once again, that's just saying it never gets ruled out. Whereas we want to say affirmatively, and in fact, it will eventually happen. So the way we can do that is by adding a new operator. So this calligraphic I, which we can pronounce inevitably, uh, will have the interpretation in every possible future branch of time, there will come a point where the prejacent is true. So if you think of time as having this this, you know, the underlying frame has this tree-like structure, then inevitably phi is going to be forced at a world w, just in case every path through the tree above w will eventually intersect the set of worlds where phi is true. So we can call that logic S4+. Plus. And uh, we, we first motivated that operator by showing how we wanted to express that concept. We can also see that it, it earns its salt, it earns its keep by allowing us to, to say some new things, drawing some new distinctions. So for instance, we can define what it is for a choice sequence alpha to be law-like, namely for any possible uh, value on an argument, that value is inevitable. So if it's possible for alpha x to equal y, then eventually alpha x will equal y. It can't end up being anything else. So this contrasts, of course, with the case of a lawless sequence where it's possible for alpha of 0 to equal 1 or it's possible for alpha of 0 to equal 2. These are both genuine possibilities. Neither of them inevitably happens. So uh, there are some interesting things that we can express using, using this inevitability operator. But the real payoff will come when it, it lets us get a, a nice mirroring theorem like the ones that we saw earlier for the potentialist translation. So the way we'll do that is by using what are sometimes called the Beth Kripke semantics for intuitionistic logic. Um, and these are a little less familiar, I think, than, for instance, the usual Kripke semantics. So uh, we'll give you a, a brief overview of how this goes. So if we have a, a tree, so T with the less than relation, and then we have a, a family of domains. So D is a function that apply, assigns a, a set of individuals to each world W in your tree. And then we have a valuation function V. So it'll assign subsets of the domain at W to a predicate at P at W. Uh, and then we want to impose the condition that if a tuple of objects is in the interpretation of P at W, and then W extends to a world U, then that same tuple of objects is also in the interpretation of the predicate P at the world U. So we have this upward monotonicity condition. And so then uh, the inductive clauses for the, the semantics, uh, they're all here for your reference, but I just want to highlight the two in red, because those will give us a nice illustration of how we get the, the faithful interpretation. So for atoms, we have that uh, a node in your tree W will force P of A, if and only if every path through T above W includes a world U such that 
A is in the interpretation of P at U. So this contrasts with the case of the cryptic semantics for intuitionistic logic, which just looks at the world that you're in. In the cryptic semantics, you say, here in this world is the tuple A in the interpretation of P. Whereas in the Beth Kripke semantics, you say, am I eventually guaranteed to get to a world where the tuple A is in the interpretation of the predicate P? And then um, let's look next at the existential condition. So we'll say that W forces, there is an X such that A, just in case for every path through T above W, you eventually hit a world U such that for some A in the domain of U, U forces a uh, big A of little a. Maybe I should have chosen different letters there. Sorry. Um, and then uh, the other conditions kind of behave similarly and they're there for your reference if you want. But this semantics gives us a, a sound and complete semantics for, uh, for intuitionistic logic. And the other thing to note here, I see if you could click, is that the basic concept, sorry, one back. There we go. So one, the basic concepts here are basically just necessity and inevitability. So the upward monotonicity condition for the interpretation of predicates, that's like a necessity condition. Once P holds of some tuple of objects X, necessarily it holds, it continues to hold. And then this business about uh, every path through T above W, that's just saying that um, inevitably from W, every path eventually hits a world that forces the, the um, formula in question. And those are both uh, concepts that we can express in S4. So now if you could go to the next slide, we have in, this- in S4 plus, you mean now. Sorry, yes, S4 plus, exactly. So then we have this translation, uh, which is similar in spirit to how the, um, the Gödel translation can be seen as just writing explicitly using modal operators, what is implicit in the truth conditions in Kripke semantics for formulas. So similarly here, we're going to use the concepts of necessity and inevitability to just make explicit what is tucked into these more complex semantic clauses in the Beth Kripke uh, semantics for intuitionistic logic. So to highlight these again in the same cases of atoms, in the Beth Kripke semantics, you say that an atom is forced at a world W. If every path through the tree, you hit a world U that forces that P. And of course, once it's forced, it's going to be forced necessarily for all worlds above U. So that just translates as inevitably necessarily P. And that captures the same semantic conditions on the your underlying uh, tree of, of worlds. Similarly, uh, there is a sigma such that a sigma is going to translate over as inevitably there is a sigma such that then a translated of sigma. And that again captures the, uh, the, the condition of every maximal path or every, uh, every branch through the tree will eventually get you to a world U that forces a of sigma. And so from here, we get this really nice correspondence. So we say that we know the world W will force phi, considered as a Beth Kripke tree for intuitionistic logic, just in case taking, you can take literally the same tree and uh, W will force phi intuitionistically just in case W verifies the, uh, the translation of phi. And so going through that uh, correspondence recursively on the complexity of your formula phi gives you this theorem that for every formula phi and set of formulas gamma in first order logic, gamma will semantically entail phi in intuitionistic logic, just in case the translations of gamma semantically entails the translation of phi in, the, in S4 plus. So we get a nice correspondence there uh, and it would be nice to 
translate this, that's a bad word, not translate, transfer maybe from the, the model theoretic sphere to the, the deductive sphere. Um, and so we can do that too, as it happens. Um, now, uh, the logic S4 plus is not complete. It's not axiomatizable, uh, but we can axiomatize enough of it for our purposes here. So obviously we're just gonna take over the axioms of S4 with the converse Barkin formula uh, just out of, out of the box. And then we have these, uh, a couple more postulates just showing how the box and the inevitability uh, interact with each other. And then these last two, um, these last two conditions are similar to the, the converse Barkin formula in a, um, in a sense. And so then uh, if you could go to the next slide, this gives us a, a deductive mirroring theorem. So we know that uh, phi one through phi n intuitionistically um, entail psi deductively, just in case the translations of phi one through phi n entail the translation of psi in S4 plus deductively using the axioms that we just, we just sketched. And the proof of this is uh, not difficult. So to get the right to left, excuse me, the left to right direction, you just do an induction on proof. So you look at some deductive system for intuitionistic logic, you show that the translations of the axioms for that system are all provable in S4 plus, and then you show that the, the translations of the rules are all admissible. So that's pretty straightforward. The other, the converse direction is uh, not difficult, but a little more involved. So we start by going from the deductive claim that uh, phi one through phi n translate, the translations of phi one through phi n in S4 plus deductively entail psi. Then by soundness, we get the fact that the phi's will entail psi in S4 plus semantically. Then the BK correspondence gets us the corresponding semantic entailment in intuitionistic logic. And then the completeness of intuitionistic logic gets us back up to the, the de deductive entailment between the uh, phi one through phi n and psi intuitionistically. So this gives us uh, the nice kind of correspondence, the nice interpretation that we were, uh, we were after. And it does so in the case of, of this divergent, um, the case of, of divergent possibilities, which is uh, exactly the problem that we we're trying to overcome when we we're in, in giving our uh, potentialist account of, of choice sequences. Good. So, um... So that's responding to uh, to one of the desiderata that we uh, uh, set uh, out on on the translation. So let me let me take stock here and just uh, remind everyone of of what we wanted. So these mentioned desiderata and and where we are. Uh, so uh, we're looking for a translation from the uh, non-modal language to the modal one. And we'd like the translation to be uh, at least an interpretation of the logic in the non-modal language, preferably a faithful one. Uh, that is what Ethan has just taken us through. Um, and we've got, uh, got a way of translating now that is, is more uh, uh, compatible with uh, potentialism than uh, what the Gödel translation uh, was able to do. Uh, the second desiderata was to uh, give an interpretation of the mathematical theory in the uh, non-modal language. So that is what, uh, what I'm gonna look at now in the, uh, the last part of the talk. So um, uh, we're gonna use again lawless choice sequences as our example. So that will be uh, uh, the canonical uh, application really of the uh, uh, framework for divergent potent potentialism that we develop here. And um, the uh, non-modal theory of choice sequences that uh, we're gonna look at, or in fact, lawless choice sequences that we will look at is uh, Trollstrass LS for precisely lawless uh, sequence. And the mathematical theory uh, uh, in the modal language, uh, 
uh, that hopefully will then interpret the translations of or prove, sorry, the the interpret the translations of the uh, the actions of of process LS uh, that will be developed as we go along. So let's look at it. So the first axiom of um, Trollstress LS says that for every finite initial segment, then there is a sequence alpha beginning in, in just that way. And remember that uh, N here, while being a natural number, is also coding then a, a finite initial segment. So uh, the axiom is uh, formulated as LS1 on the slide here, that for every n, uh, there is a, a sequence alpha that uh, begins in, in that way. Now, there are ways of, um, uh, well, let's, let's first look at the, the translation of it. So it'll translate when you apply the Beth Kripke translation as uh, uh, the formula displayed here. So necessarily for every uh, initial segment or code thereof, n, it's inevitable that you have a choice sequence that begins in, in that way. And uh, uh, this translation can be proved in, in uh, various somewhat informative ways, but they're not super informative. So what we do here is simply adopt this as an action. So this is a little bit of a, a cheat really, but uh, it's not uh, a non-natural way to go since this is a pretty natural axiom to, to lay down on the, uh, the modal side as a, as a kind of sharpening of what you mean by a lawless uh, sequence. So even for the lawless ones, you get to specify some finite initial segment with which it begins. But it gets more, more interesting. So uh, next, uh, we're gonna be concerned with the uh, composability of uh, choice sequences. And have, uh, so composability in the usual sense of joint possibility. Uh, and we're gonna have a modal axiom that says something about when possibilities are composable or jointly possible. So consider two distinct uh, choice sequences, alpha and beta. And suppose that alpha could continue in one way and that beta could continue in some way. Then it's possible for both sequences to continue as described, right? So these two possibilities are jointly possible because we're talking about two distinct sequences and they're completely uh, uh, lawless so there are no constraints uh, that, that somehow link one to the other. So to uh, express this more systematically we need a little bit of notation. So we're going to write uh, distinct in front of alpha in front of a string of choice sequences to indicate that or abbreviate that the first one is distinct from uh, each of the uh, remaining items in the sequence, uh, uh, as you can see on the slide. And then we're gonna write uh, sharp or double struck out uh, identity uh, of such a string to formalize the claim that any pairwise identity comparison is false except of course the, the trivial one that uh, uh, the ith is identical with the, the ith. But for any distinct j, uh, they're distinct. So with that in place, uh, we can now uh, lay down an action scheme that describe how possibilities concerning distinct choice sequences are compossible. It looks a little uh, forbidding here, but it's, it's really very simple and unnatural. So you've got a bunch of uh, distinct choice sequences. In fact, n plus one of them, the alpha i. And then you have a possibility concerning the first, possibility concerning the second, possibility concerning all the way out through the, the nth. Then the claim is that all these possibilities are compossible. Right? So it's possible that all those scenarios should uh, simultaneously obtain. And we are requiring that each of the formulas phi i uh, uh, only have uh, 
alpha i as a parameter, no other Turing sequence, right? Since otherwise you, you may get these uh, connections between uh, these possibilities that are described. So that is a reasonable uh, claim to, uh, to lay down when you're, you're explicating in this classical modal setting uh, uh, how we think about lawless Turing sequences. And an example of that would be that uh, if it's possible for the next entry of alpha to be zero, and it's possible for the next entry of beta to be one, then it's possible for both of these entries simultaneously to, uh, to be as described. So compositability. Now we're gonna put this uh, to work. And the target now will be uh, uh, one of the actions of, uh, of uh, Trollstra's uh, theory, LS2. Uh, and to describe that axiom, uh, we need uh, a little piece of notation. So uh, coex alpha uh, comma beta, that abbreviates that alpha and beta are coextensive in the obvious sense. So for every uh, argument, uh, their values are identical. And then uh, we're now in a position to derive the Beth Kripke translation of the second axiom of Trollstra's theory, namely that for any two uh, choice uh, lawless choice sequences, alpha and beta, either they're coextensive or they're not. Right? So you have decidability of uh, coextensionality uh, uh, claims which at the outset is a little bit surprising since uh, uh, these claims are concerned with all kinds of possibilities that aren't real yet. So you might naively have thought that these are precisely the kinds of possibilities that will give rise to uh, failures of, of LEM, but that isn't so uh, according to, uh, to uh, the axiom LS2. And the way we prove the uh, Beth Kripke translation of, of LS2 uh, is uh, uh, pretty simple. Um, so uh, suppose first that the, uh, the two sequences are identical. Then obviously the uh, translation of the for first disjunct will be provable. Uh, suppose next uh, that uh, the sequences are distinct. Uh, then it's possible that alpha should continue in one way and beta should continue in some, some different way. So these possibilities by our previous axiom are jointly uh, possible. And that allows us to prove then the Beth Kripke tr translation of the, uh, the second discharge. Right? So this is somewhat illuminating in terms of, of just uh, showing in this uh, classical modal setting uh, why the uh, the action LS2 uh, is a reasonable one to, to have. Can I, can I stick in a little clarification here? Sure, do. Um, so go back to the previous slide. So th this axiom corresponds to a comment that Trollstra made that uh, the only way that uh, informal comment at the be you know, at the beginning of the uh, of the development that the only way that um, two lawless sequences can be identical is if they're given as such. Mm. So, um, in effect, this axiom uh, recapitulates that. Well, the, that is the decidability of, of coextension, extension, the, the, the decidability of coextensiveness of two, two, two choice, choice sequences, I think recapitulates that. It does recapitulate it, but by my lights, it actually goes beyond. And, and oh, no, of course. I find this more, more illuminating, uh, yeah. of course, since I have more of a classical mind. So. I find this uh, uh, explanatory in a way that uh, Trollstra's gloss uh, isn't quite. So it's compatible with uh, what you mentioned, Stuart, but uh, uh, I think goes beyond a little bit. No, I, I, I didn't mean that it that it yeah. that it re, that it just is it, it but it, um, it it fits it fits in nicely with it. That's right. See, we're converging. Uh, so. Uh, last action that we're going to look at uh, is uh, uh, LS3. Um, and this is known as the, the open data axiom. And we're actually gonna use here just a, a, an easy version of it to, to illustrate. Since uh, all conceptual issues are, are uh, nicely captured by, by this easy version. And the easy version is that if you make a judgment A about some uh, 
Lawler's sequence alpha. Then there is some finite initial segment n, uh, which alpha has, and such that every sequence that begins in that way gives rise to the same judgment. Right? So for every beta that has that uh, initial segment, uh, you have A of beta as well. Okay. Um, so that is what the axiom says uh, in the uh, uh, non-modal language of, of ordinary choice sequences. Now, over on the modal side, um, uh, we contend that the following axiom scheme makes sense. So you've got a claim now phi of a bunch of different choice sequences. So alpha and a bunch of, of, of betas. And furthermore, uh, alpha is distinct from each of the, uh, the betas. There may be identities amongst the, the betas, but alpha is distinct from each and every beta. And thirdly, uh, the initial segment of alpha is, uh, is n, or the, uh, the segment coded by, by n. Um, uh, then the claim is, uh, uh, two here, uh, that necessarily every sequence that begins with that uh, initial segment, every such uh, sequence uh, gamma, which is also distinct from each and every beta, give ri gives rise to the very same judgment. So you have phi of uh, gamma and all the betas. Or to, uh, to, to give this more of a, a prose clause, uh, uh, phi only looks at the initial segment of alpha that is available at the relevant world. So whatever phi says about alpha, it also says about any gamma that shares the initial, mentioned initial segment. Okay, that is what, uh, what our modal axiom to says. And then it's not hard to, uh, to see that our uh, modal axiom too uh, entails the Beth Kripke translation of, uh, of Trollstra's uh, open data action. I mean, you could use the uh, this easy, uh, easy version of, of LS3 uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to test that. And uh, Trollstra goes on to, to formulate, I think, uh, just one more axiom for um, uh, the lawless sequences. Uh, and we conjecture, although we haven't properly proved this, uh, that, uh, that, uh, those, that axiom can be handled in the same way. Ethan's dissertation uh, goes into to some of this. Um, but without having all of the machinery that we have told you about uh, yet available. So just to, uh, to sum up uh, what we've done then. So uh, we used the uh, intuitionistic theory of free choice sequences to motivate the need for a modal analysis of divergent potentialism. Right? So a free choice sequence is, uh, is a potentially infinite uh, kind of object. So it kind of cries out for a modal analysis of the potentialist aspect of it. But this is divergent, right? That's our first uh, claim. Then we explain the challenge of connecting the ordinary theory of choice sequences, which is totally non-modal, with our modal expectation. So we need a translation from the non-modal language into the modal one that satisfies, we hope, the two uh, uh, desiderata. Then we uh, check that the first desideratum can be satisfied by using the uh, uh, beth kripke semantics uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, give what we call the beth kripke translation and check that that provides a faithful uh, interpretability result. And then uh, using that translation, uh, we actually applied it to, uh, to uh, uh, translate the uh, axioms of uh, Trollstras for lawless uh, choice sequences, and then to verify that these axioms, when translated, can be proved in a very reasonable classical modal uh, analysis of, uh, of these sequences. So that's it. Thank you.